The newest version of the Utah Jazz are now 2-2 two and two in four games. Is this a 500 team that could make the play in the rest of the way? Probably not. But why would you doubt Team 49? It is Locked On Jazz. Pow. You are Locked On Jazz, your daily podcast on the Utah Jazz. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. The Utah Jazz beat the Indiana Pacers last night. They're 2-2, two and two, or you really should say they're 2-1 and one in their three games with this new team. We'll look at the difference of this ball game, the point guard, this team, the point guard play of Sexton and Horton Tucker. Lowry Markkinen's new world. Is there any three-point shooting left? Can we be better defensively? The role of the rookies and Kelly Olynyk picking up the slack. That's all coming up on today's edition of Locked on Jazz. I'm David Locke, your radio Radio voice and jazz NBA insider. This, sorry, someone just knocked on my door. No, thank you. Whatever that knock is. Uh, all right, where was I? Uh, this is Locked on Jazz, your daily podcast in the Utah Jazz, giving you inside expertise, geeky numbers, and hopefully making it way better to be a jazz fan each and every day. Thanks so much for tuning in and making Locked on Jazz your first listen every single day. So I am standing today, if you can't tell, um, and so I'll be bouncing all around the screen. Uh, this is one of these hotels that's decided it's cute and fun to have no um, desk in your room anymore because they. why would you have a workplace when you come to town? Um, this hotel actually has my ire up right now. Just every little tiny thing is not right. So I'm not going to complain because we stay in perfectly nice places, and it's. Um, but I'm complaining. But it's got my goat right now. So, as Dr. K, Ron Kimmon says, he's our sports psychologist. All right. Um, thanks so much uh, for tuning in. Uh, so, we're four games in, but I think you can kind of dismiss the first game against Minnesota. As one person said to me, that if there's ever been a clear event on how much the Jazz liked Mike Conley and maybe how much the Timberwolves did not like D'Angelo Russell, uh, that was the event. Like, the Jazz were shell-shocked, broken, um, overwhelmed. and Mike Conley being traded an hour before the game, and the uh, Timberwolves looked like they got out of jail free card uh, from the way they played that game. So if we take the three games that we've now seen out of this new version of the Utah Jazz, and it's, and it's dramatically different, frankly, uh, without the traditional point guard and with Sexton and Horton Tucker as your point guards, like, what do we have? Uh, first thing is we have fight. Like, that is the most remarkable part about this, is that this team just continues to play hard, fight. The essence of what Will Hardy has instituted about Team 49 has shown in every single one of these games still. It, like, has not changed one iota, which is super impressive uh, to who they are. The sample size is crazy small, but in three games now, and understanding its sample size is crazy small, the Jazz defense is now up to 21st in the league defensively, <clears throat> whereas the offense is 10th. So for the season, the Jazz offense is the third or fourth best offense in the NBA, depending on the day. Uh, today, it is the third. Um, tied with Boston. And then defensively, we're 26, 27, or 28, depending on the day. So 26 right now after last night. We've jumped ahead of Portland and Houston. Actually, we're, we don't go down as far as 28. They're, they're all closely bunched together. So Charlotte had a good day. Actually, they didn't. They allowed a million points to Atlanta. But anyway, so we're 26. The question, so if you kind of look at those two things, fourth and 26, on this new team, the question I have is, can we be 13 and 17? Like, I don't think that this team's capable of being a top-four offensive team. It's ju with, it doesn't have enough three-point shooting. It made three-point shots last night. Um, it's just, and maybe I need to adapt. It's a dramatically different team. I mean, we are now attacking the tin on all, on, with, with a vigor that is elite in the NBA, and that's, We'll talk about that in a second with the change of kind of who our point guards are and how we're playing. But we've taken going into last night in the first three games, and again, that Minnesota game I do think you kind of dismiss, but we had taken 36, 36, and 38 shots 
at the rim, and the I didn't the official number on last night is now in at 32. So we're plus 30 shots at the rim. We only had done that in one game since January 8th, and only in three games all season till or excuse me, th- since uh, November 21st. So since November 21st, we'd had three games of 30 or more shots at the rim. We've now had four straight. So we're a wildly different attacking offensive team than we had been prior. And then defensively, the question is, can we be better? Our point of attack defense with Mike was not very good. Jared Vanderbilt was very active, but I would not call him a good defensive player, and the numbers showed it. Like, if you dig into some of our uh, on-floor, off-floor numbers, when Vando was on the floor, we were not very good defensively. Uh, He's just so slim and slender, and if he's trying to do any type of rim defense, that's just not what he can do. And then out on the floor, I think he's a little jumpy. Um, And so he just, you know, our defense is six and a half points better when he's off the floor than on the floor. And then Malik was also three points defensively better when he was off the floor than on the floor. And Mike, we were three points better off the floor than on the floor with all three of them. And so can we suddenly, by playing Ochai Abaji and having Walker Kessler as a center, be better defensively than we were? And so then all of a sudden, we're not the fourth best offensive team. We're like the 10th. But we're also not the 26th ranked defensive team. We're like this, you know, maybe we're 13th offensively, 17th defensively. That's a 500 team. We stay at 500. We stay in this play-in battle the whole way. I don't know. I mean, frankly, I didn't think we were going to be 2-1 and one on the road trip at this point. So, you know, once again, don't doubt Team 49. There's some reasons why not. I'll, I'll, I'll give those to you in a second. I, I have some reasons why not. Um, I'm not. I'm not totally sure that I buy that entirely. I'll, I'll, I'll get to that here in a second. The biggest change, though, is what we just talked about. The Colin Sexton, Taylor Horton Tucker combination. They do play a few minutes together every night, but basically this is your new guard line. And if you look at the productivity we're getting out of the point guard spot is so wildly different than what Mike Conley brought. And what Mike Conley brought was terrific. That, this is not to say one is better than the other. I'm just saying one is incredibly different. So if we look at the last three games, again, let's throw the Minnesota game out. I mean, there were literally tears in the locker room like that Mike Conley was leaving. Um, and there might have been, you know, and, th- and this might have been including front office coaches and staff and, and players. But right now between Colin Sexton and Taylor Horton Tucker, you're getting – you, your point guard position used to be giving you eight shots a night. You're now getting tw- – out of Mike Conley. You're getting 23 shots a night out of these guys. Now, they're not shooting the threes well at all, right? This is where the problem is. You're getting 10 free throws a night, 11 free throws a night out of them. Horton Tucker and Sexton are combining for 13 assists and six rebounds a night. Here, Horton – they're – Saxon's playing 32 and Horton Tucker's playing 24. So that comes out to 56 minutes. So that's a little high, right? They're, they're combining for six to eight minutes a night together. But the two of them combined right now are giving the Jazz 31 points, six rebounds, 13 assists a night, going to the free throw line 11 times a night, and living at the rim. Living at the rim. It's crazy. It's super impressive is really what it is. It's a very different game reading a defense and making the right play and setting up teammates is not the strength of either of these guys. And so it's a much more difficult way to play for everyone else on the floor. Like we saw it, that Malik Beasley's slump started the moment Mike Conley got hurt. Like Mike Conley sets up Malik Beasley at a, at a, at a really high level and and that we don't have that going on right now. And that's a little bit of like the next thing to talk about is Lowry's new world. And we'll get to that in just a moment. <clears throat> but this is a completely new and different offensive team for the Utah Jazz than they've ever had or that we've seen this year. This is not the 
this is not, and Will Hardy's adjusting. I'm going to shoot around and literally watching as Will Hardy kind of puts in a new offensive play or emphasizes a new offensive play for Colin Sexton or puts in a new um, wrinkle to a play because in the last three games, Colin Sexton has taken 23 shots at the rim. Colin Sexton took 10 shots at the rim last night. The dude's got a superpower, and that is he gets going downhill and he gets to the rim and he is going to beat you. And it's pretty awesome. And so if you're playing against the Jazz, you now, this is what you're going to have to deal with. Now, teams are going to adjust to this and be able to adapt, and we're going to see that's going to be the next iteration is, okay, we're pretty one-dimensional right now. We don't have a lot of three-point shooting, though we hit some last night. but like, And we don't have natural Sexton and Horton Tucker don't read naturally, so as teams adjust, I think there's going to be some ugly moments here um, as they try to evolve as point guards. But this is a different game. And Talon's attacking with the same power and vigor. Earlier this year, if you remember, Nikhil Alexander-Walker played and, and played all right, and then all of a sudden Talon Horton Tucker kind of went back in the line, but a lot of people were surprised. Like, the thought there from the Jazz was like, okay, Horton Tucker's got a skill set and a chance that gives him an opportunity to do some do some things. He's got, he took 13 shots, or he took 19 shots of the rim in the three previous games before last night. So these guys are just getting on top of the tin. And it changes who we are. But it does mean like a brand new world and difficulty for Lowry Markkinen. And it does mean some other things as we have really a lack of three-point shooting. And we'll touch on those things as we continue. Today's show is brought to you by our good friends over at Murdoch Hyundai, located at 4646 South State Street, also located in Logan and in Linden. The Murdoch family's been in Utah for over 80 years, giving Utah incredible customer service. Their phrase is no regrets. We want to make sure that when you buy a car and you're with us, you have absolutely no regrets when you're done with Murdoch. And the Hyundai lineup of cars, absolutely fabulous. You know me. I'm a research guy. I've looked into a bunch of these things, done all the research, and what do I find out with the research is uh, is that... The Hyundai car gives you the most bells and most whistles you can possibly get for your car. I'm driving the Santa Cruz right now, which is their hybrid truck car. Super fun. Great car to have for the winter. Uh, the lineup of SUVs is absolutely fabulous, uh, With starting with the little Kona and working it's all the way up to the Palisade. We've bought two Santa Cruises uh, or Santa Fe's already. Uh, it is Murdoch Hyundai, located 4646 South State Street. If you're looking for a car, include the Hyundai, and make sure you include me in the process because I – want to give you the opportunity to have the VIP treatment that you can get from our friends Cam over at the Murdoch's, uh, the Murray store, or Jake over at the, uh, at the uh, Linden, Linden, yeah, Linden store. So feel free. Today's show is also brought to you by FanDuel. FanDuel.com slash locked on gets you all the latest. Hope you took advantage of the great Super Bowl deals that FanDuel had going on. That was pretty fun. Here's the latest going on with FanDuel right now the number one sports book in America. It's the NBA time. The no sweat first bet continues because new customers get up to $1,000 on bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sports app. It's safe, secure, super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores to threes drained. You can figure out whatever you want to play with the player props or you can do exclusive bets like two three-pointers scored in the first three minutes, all sorts of fun things like that. FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance to bigger payout with the same game parlay. So don't miss the chance for your no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash LockedOn. That's FanDuel.com slash LockedOn. To learn more, make every moment more with FanDuel, the official sports betting partner of the NBA and the official sports book of Locked On. Thanks so much for making Locked On your first listen of the day. For your second listen, the 22-minute sports recap of the day, Locked On Sports Today. Jump aboard. Enjoy it. So Lowry's got a new world here. The Jazz, early in the year, were playing Lowry off advantages. He was getting the ball with an advantage all the time. He is not getting that anymore. And this is going to be a really interesting 20-game stretch to watch. Now, Colin found him on one or two yesterday that 
frankly, were great reads by Colin. He continues to develop. Um, it, the number to watch will be how many of Lowry's field goals are assisted. Um, he has slumped on the three-point shooting pretty badly ever since he actually made the All-Star team. I don't think they're related, but it absolutely is that day. But if you look at one of the numbers on Lowry this year is that 65% of his field goals have been assisted for the season. Now, last year in Cleveland, it was 68. His last year in Chicago, when he really just became a post-up guy, was 73. And the year, we've talked about this a lot, if you've been locked on Jazz all year, in the second year of his career in Chicago, they gave him the ball, they let him make plays, they did a lot of things. He was only at 53% of his two-point shots were assisted. Uh, he's at 65% for the season. I'm going to guess that he goes back down to like the 53%. Like this is going to be the final 20 games of the season. This is going to be Lowry marketing, having to figure out how to go get his own buckets. Um, because... It's it's going to be a a much bigger scuffle for him to go get the ball. Um, last night, if my numbers are correct, he finishes with 10 field goals, eight of them twos. Only three of the eight were assisted. So that's a wildly different number for Lowry Markin right now is that only three of his eight two-point field goals were assisted last night. That's, he was up, we just talked about it, that, that's well under 50%. Like this, this is, Taylor Horton Tucker and Colin Sexton are doing a great job, but finding, setting guys up the same way are is not their strength. In, it was a little better in New York, I believe it was four of his six field goals were assisted. Now he also went nine of 23, like we're, his efficiency is down. His three-point shooting is down, which actually probably has something to do with these guys, but maybe not a ton. I have thought he's taken a little bit more contested shots because he just doesn't have as much room on the floor. Um, his three-point shooting, uh, three of ten last night, two of seven, three of seven, one of seven in the four games um, since Mike Conley left. Uh, so it's going to be a little different for Lowry. He has a lot less space. He has a lot less maneuverability. He's getting the ball with less of an advantage. He's going to have to use the last 20 games to start developing some of these skills. We saw him last night in the post on a smaller guy. And one of the few times he slipped through the double team and another time he got it stolen. These are all parts of the learning process of what we're watching out of him this year to get as he continues to get better. And then one of the things that's going to be tough is we just don't have the same three-point shooting. Like Malik and... And Mike really were our high-level, high-volume three-point shooters. And particularly when you get to off-the-bounce threes, we only have Jordan Clarkson at this point. And that's a little bit why last night Will Hardy, like, tells Jordan, like, let it fly. Like, I need you. Like, I really got to let you got to let it fly. We, like, I, I appreciate you driving the basket and trying to get in the paint, but we got guys to do that now. But Colin Sexton takes a long time to get the ball off, is not a particularly uh, proficient off-the-bounce three-point shooter. If you look at the Jazz, Jordan's taken 201. The next guy on our roster is Horton Tucker's taken 45, and Sexton's taken 42. Sexton's only taken an off-the-bounce three, like less than one a game, and it's only if he's just wide open. Markkinen's only taken 41. So we're down to a single off-the-bounce three-point shooter. And in that case, you know, that's really how you bump up your three-point numbers. Beasley and Conley were each taking about three a game. So you were getting an extra six off-the-bounce three-point shots there. Mike, for whatever reason, last year, second best in the NBA. This year was only at 32%, small sample size. But Horton Tucker's taking 45 and 45 games. Collins taking 42 and 46 games. Markin's taking 41 and 54 games. And then that's it. Like, we don't have another guy that takes off-the-bounce threes on the roster. So J.C. is our only off-the-bounce three-point shooter right now. And then when you get to the catch-and-shoot game, we have some guys that aren't good catch-and-shoot three-point shooters that are now playing a lot of minutes, and so they're going to drive it. Rightfully so. That's what they should do. They're going to they're drive it instead of taking that three. So Markin's taking 346, like he's going to shoot it. But then, and 
Clarkson's taken 226, but he's only shooting 34%. Alinex at 40%. And now you're kind of, it falls off. Rudy Gay's at 24% on catch and shoot threes. You'd probably rather have him work it in. Sexton's at 37, 38%. It's fine. He's, but it takes him, as I said, it takes him a long time to get that off. So he's not going to be a high volume three point shooter. Horton Tucker is taking 63 catch and shoots. He's making 22%. That's probably not a shot you want him to take. And then Abaji is, if he gets that corner three, we want him to take it every time. He's at 50%. But that's, and, and a bunch of our guys really struggle on above the break threes. So, again, you just don't have the same proficient three point shooting, which I think also is going to limit where Lowry's above the break, or room is our, our above the break three-point shooting teams are going to I think come close to start daring us like Clarkson's at 34 percent on above the break Rudy Gay's at 22 percent Abaji's at 19 percent Horton Tucker's at 26 percent Fontecchio's at 27 percent Lowry's great uh at 38 percent Linux great at 39 percent and Collins great at 40 percent uh when he takes it, but you're gonna. There's just not as much room for Lowry, so it's just a brand new world for him and what he has to combat right now. Um. So the question then, to me, with this is, can we be better on defense? And I talked about it a little bit earlier, and this is where I'll I'll start to calm the the optimism a little bit. Um. And that is the key to the reason we'd be better defensively is because Walker Kessler and Ochai Abaji are playing. And I don't know that you can rely on defensive players, rookies to be good defensive players night in and night out. I think it's really interesting that Abaji is getting the assignment on Tyrese Halliburton late in the game and he's getting these experiences and he's doing a fairly good job of it. But I'm not sure this is something you can rely on. This is not really how it works in the NBA that you can re- put your your two rookies on the floor. The other one is I talk a lot about 240 minutes that you have to have 240 minutes of N- to be a high le- of a good NBA team that you have to have 240 minutes of basketball. 240 is 48 times 5. And we had what was I think the misnomer on the Jazz when the year started is we had 240 minutes of basketball. Like, you look at the Rockets and the Spurs and these teams that are tanking or not doing well. Um, they don't have 240 minutes of basketball. I'm not sure this Pacers totally had 240 minutes of basketball. Last night. Right now, we don't have 240 minutes of proven NBA rotation player minutes. And that'll that's a lot to overcome. So as much as like it's exciting, all these things are exciting, and I can kind of sell you on all the reasons on the front side of this of like, hey, this team I think could go 500 the rest of the way and play for the play. I think trading three guys, four guys, and not having any of the other guys play yet is hard. Now, I think Juan Toscana Anderson may play before this year is over, and I think Damian Jones may play before this year is over. But right now, Simone Fontecchio is trying to figure out whether he's an NBA rotation player. Adoka Azubuke is trying to figure out whether he's an NBA rotation. And Rudy Gay, who's played really well recently in the last four or five games, is playing much, much better. Um, Up until the last five games had not been a particularly solid piece offensively or defensively for the Jazz. He's played really well, kind of inspired almost, that, okay, Mike Conley's gone. I've got to do something and also look at this roster I'm on the floor with. I actually have to go score, and he's he's made a bunch of plays and been really, really good. But I, I look at us, and as, as much as I want to, like, up the ante and say, hey, we can still compete and play 500 and do this, and these are the reasons why, and we can get to 17 defensively and 13 defensively, the idea that we're relying on two rookies defensively to be able to have that happen and two that we actually don't have 240 minutes of NBA proven rotation basketball right now in our rotation, I think makes that too big a too big a jump uh, to ask this team. And that would be my quick argument against what I presented earlier. But we shall see. Over time, we'll find out whether I'm right or not. The role of the rookies the rest of the way. One player that has stepped up impressively and some late game watch notes all coming up for you as we continue on Locked on Jazz.
Today's show is brought to you in part by our friends over at uh, LinkedIn Jobs. Uh, LinkedIn is, uh, if you're looking to hire someone right now, and you're a small company, and you've been through the hiring process, you can like, I think you can probably feel the anguish in my voice as I'm saying this, uh, having done this. You can like, your entire company can get just buried on the quest and the effort to hire. And that's where LinkedIn Jobs comes in. They help you quickly attract qualified candidates to your open jobs with targeting tools. They go beyond resume data by using insights from your job post company and their 875 member profiles to put your post in front of the most qualified candidates. And then they identify the most qualified candidates on LinkedIn Jobs and connect with them fast and free. LinkedIn Jobs makes it easy to screen and rate applicants based on your job qualifications all on one platform. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your jobs for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NBA. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NBA to post your job for free. Terms and conditions do apply. Let LinkedIn Jobs help you along the way. For your second listen today, try Locked On Big Board, NBA Big Board. Locked On NBA Big Board. The guys do a great job, bring you fabulous draft content and get you ready for it. All right. Uh, quick thought on Ochai Abaji and Walker Kessler, though, frankly, we probably should have left this for tomorrow. Um, actually, I will. It's a longer conversation. What do we expect out of them in the final? What are we like down to? Like, it's so funny. We're on All Star break and we have like 22 games left. Is that right? Aren't we playing like our 60th game tomorrow? Such a weird time we put in all-star break um i want to tip a hat to kelly Olinick before we do late game watch he's just totally changed how he's playing understate looks around and just he has such an incredibly intuitive understanding of what is coming and what has to happen uh in an nba game and how to help a team win he's just super like he's just completely changed the way he's played like he's playing point guard he's conduct- conducting Understands what Sexton, Horton, Tucker do great. It's it's really impressive. All right. Um, late game watch. Lakers, Warriors from a few nights ago. Um, Schroeder, not Russ, D'Angelo Russell bringing down the team and running the offense. Maybe because Russell doesn't know yet or they see Russell as more of an off-guard shooting guard. Um, Anthony Davis is really awesome. Uh, the Lakers looked a million times better until last night, I guess, when they got blown out by Portland. They are actually playing viable NBA players. Like, that was the thing that jumped out to me the most about the Lakers is they actually look like they're closer to 240 minutes. Um, the Lakers really caused the Warriors problems by Anthony Davis just sitting in the middle of the lane and not guarding Draymond Green at all. And the only answer to that is to play dribble handoff with Klay Thompson, Jordan Poole. Poole scored like 14 straight to open the fourth quarter. Um, I thought there was a really telling moment for the Warriors. Klay Thompson could not get free from Austin Reeves. I'm worried about the Warriors. Uh, Ron Boone is too, by the way. He and I um, are watching. Rui Hashimura has played well. Uh, the Warriors just cannot get actions off their regular set. Now, Steph's not playing, but they cannot get actions off their regular set. And that's interesting. Dallas, Sacramento. I didn't get any late game watches last night because by the time we hit, I couldn't get the games by the time we got on the plane. Um, so I'll watch those today and then have those for you later. Uh, you know why Sacramento's so good? Because Kevin Herter's really good. I mean, not only can he shoot, not only can he play handoff, but he can conduct and come off the pick and roll and hit pocket passes. Kevin Herter's really good. Why Atlanta let Kevin Herter go is a grandiose mystery to me. And why they decided they had to have DeJounte Murray and let Kevin Herter go is really... Um, and one of the reasons Sacramento's turned the corner is De'Aaron Fox is having this master season in the clutch, but it's also because they're running a lot through Kevin Herter, which frees De'Aaron Fox and lets De'Aaron Fox play to his superpowers, to play to where he's best. Um, this is the first time Doncic and Kyrie are together. Boy, Luka has the ball a lot. He just is used to having the ball a lot. Uh, Mike Brown is the king of the strangest challenges I've ever seen. The NBA just, see these coaches have not figured out challenges. Mike Brown is one of them. He challenged a play the other night that had no point expected value at all. Like literally zero. And it wasn't even one of his good players. Uh, Kyrie looks super comfortable. 
He's so clear he's played off the ball with a lot of really good players before, and this was not something that was a problem for him. Uh, so he looks super comfortable. Teams are still doubling Luka. Um, the last two possessions were just awful. The Kings had 10 seconds left, had a timeout, don't use it, run nothing. Uh, Luka, in the weirdest thing, the Mavericks are down three with 18 seconds left. And Luka takes a step back three from like, with like 14 seconds left. The right play is to drive, get in the lane, go for the two. They had a timeout left too. Cut it back down to one, foul again. If they miss a free throw, then it's down to two and you have a chance to win. Your best case scenario, if you, even if you hit that three with 14 seconds left, is that they have a chance to go down and win the game. There's no scenario where you win the game in regulation that way. So that was really mismanaged by Jason Kidd and Luka and was really bad. Um, and it just was, yeah, that was just a super bad possession. The math, late game math is not a strength by some coaches right now in the NBA. I hate to be that guy sitting here and saying, these kind of things. Uh, Philadelphia, Brooklyn. Philadelphia is playing an interesting defense. So they're not doubling, but they're like zoning James Harden or one of their guys in the top of the key. So Spencer Dinwiddie for Brooklyn was up high with the ball, being guarded, and then to the middle of the floor, James Harden's not actually guarding anyone. He's literally just staying at the top of the key, so it's not illegal defense because he's not in the paint. But he's almost standing at the one step out of the free throw line. And then they're kind of zoned up on the backside already in pre-rotation so that if Dinwiddie drives, there's going to be a double. <clears throat> and then if the if he doesn't drive, the rotations are much shorter to get back. It's a pretty interesting move by Doc Rivers. Um, and I like it. Like, I think you're going to see more and more teams do that. Everyone's doubling, and they're doubling overly aggressively, and they're doubling at 40 feet, and it doesn't really work. Um, I think you're going to see this... Keep, keep watching this. This is an evolution. This is why we're doing late game watch. This one's important. Uh, the Nets were closing with all new players. Royce O'Neal was not on the floor. They literally were closing with like all their brand new players. Miles Bridges, Cam Johnson, etc. Um, it is really hard to score NBA games late with a collection of average players. Like that was really obvious. Uh, Jacques Vaughn wrote, ran a super cool play. Shake Milton of Philadelphia made an amazing read to stop it and shut it down and save the game for Philadelphia. Uh, really cool multiple loop inbound play. And James Harden is just simply the smartest player I've ever seen. Um, Orlando's really good, by the way. I watched a little Miami Orlando. I didn't finish it. Orlando won again last night. Orlando desperately needs a point guard. That's obvious watching them. And Miami just is perfectly spaced at every moment of every second of every game. It's kind of awesome. All right, that is Late Game Watch. We'll have more of those because I love them. Hopefully you're enjoying that as well. Uh, usually I tell you to, like, tell me if you don't, but I actually love them so much and have learned so much doing I'm going to keep doing it and keep sharing with you, and hopefully you learn as well. Have a great one. Talk to you soon. It is Locked on Jazz, your daily podcast in the Utah Jazz from the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day.